Inshallah, tonight we will do the tafsir of the ninth verse of Surah Al-Kahab. And inshallah, from this verse onwards, we will spend few sessions talking about the people of the cave. The first story of Surah Al-Kahab, which is about the people of the cave. <coughs> In verse number 9, 10, and 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala summarizes the entire story of the people of the cave. And then for the next page and a half, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us all the details about this story that we need to know. <coughs> so it is as if there is a muqaddimah, there is an introduction in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala summarizes it in a nutshell. And then there is a detailed analysis of every single incident that happened in the story of the people of the cave. So inshallah today we will do the summary of the story of the people of the cave. And again inshallah I'm not going to take more than 10-15 minutes. But very quickly, we will try to do the summary of the story of the people of the cave. And then, inshallah, from next session onwards, we'll go into all the details that we need to know, inshallah. <clears throat> now, it is if, when, when you read the ayat, it is as if you will feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered the question that the Quraysh posed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah answered their question in the first few verses. And then after those few verses, Allah gave them so much information that they didn't even ask for. They were challenging Rasulullah. Rasulullah said, you know the story, right? you know the background. Mm -hmm. They were challenging Rasulullah, so Allah gave their answer in three verses. Mm -hmm. And then Allah gave them so much more details on top of that, that they didn't even ask for. <coughs> so Allah began this ayah, Allah began this, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began this story by asking a question. And that's the ayah, that's the tafsir we will do tonight, inshallah. Allah asked a question, verse number 9. Am hasibata anna ashab al-kahfi warraqeen. Did you think, did you assume that the people of the cave and the people of ar-raqeen, we will try to translate this ar-raqeen later. Did you assume that the people of the cave and the people of ar-raqeen kanu min ayatina ajaba? That they are one of the most marvelous signs of Allah, or they are one of the most wondrous signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. Did you assume that? Mm -hmm. That this story of the people of the cave is of the most wondrous signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. You Quraysh, you came and you challenged Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by asking this question, tell us about the people of the cave. And in your mind you are thinking that the people of the cave and the story of the people of cave is the most wonderful and amazing thing that Allah has ever done. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here telling them that this matter of the people of the cave, it's very trivial, it's very small. There are many more bigger signs, many, many more bigger signs. But you want to ask me questions about something that's utterly trivial. If you look into the grand scale of the things, you are amazed by it. You think it's a big, big, big miracle. You think that this story of the people of the cave is, is, is of the most wondrous signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's why you want to quiz Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with that but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that there are much more bigger signs mm. there are many much more bigger signs there are bigger truth, there are bigger signs of the truth of prophethood of prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for example, his conduct, his character, this Quran itself all of this is a bigger miracle of the story of the people of the cave and you want to ignore all these big miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you want to quiz him on something that is so trivial about the people of the cave, the story. This is a miracle. Don't you think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is undermining the importance of that story? But Allah is saying that there are so much more bigger miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that if you think about it, you will know that he is the prophet. Then why are you quizzing him on something so trivial? Kanu min ayatina ajaba. Now Allah said, Ashab al Kahf wa Raqim. Did you assume that the people of Kahf are people of Ar Raqim? What is Ar Raqim? Let's try to understand it. Different scholars have different opinion with regards to this word Ar Raqim. Some have said that Ar Raqim was the name of the mountain that the cave was in. Hmm. The name of the mountain that the cave was in. That mountain name was Ar Raqim. Hmm. So the people of the cave and the people of the mountain, Ar Raqim. Hmm. Some scholars have said that ar raqim was an inscribed tablet that they, that they put to cover the entrance or to block the entrance of the cave. There was this inscribed tablet, tablet or tablet, whatever you call it, inscribed tablet that they used to cover the face of the cave. 
So when people discover these sleepers in the cave, later on, many, many years, after many, many years, they discover these sleepers in the cave, they inscribe something on that tablet. That's why these people are called the people of the cave and the people of inscription. The, the tablet or the stone they used to cover the face of the cave, when people found them, when people discovered the sleepers <coughs> in the cave, they inscribed something. <coughs> so that's why these people are called the people of the cave and the people of inscription. But in either case, the reference is made to the same kind of people. And these people are the people of the cave. <coughs> now, before I begin this story, so Allah basically what Allah is saying in the tafsir of this ayah, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the people of the cave is not the biggest sign of the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There are many more bigger signs. You don't want to ask about those bigger signs. You want to ask about the story of the people of the cave. Here is the story of the people of the cave. Now do we understand the tafsir of this ayah? Before we begin the story of the people of the cave, it's very important for me to share with you the purpose and the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling the stories in the Quran. Tell the stories in the Quran. We need to understand that the stories of the Quran is the constant theme of the Quran. Ulama of Tafsir have said one third of the Quran is stories. And this is not far from the truth. One third of Quran is stories. One third of Quran is theology, aqidah. And one third of Quran is law, sharia. One third of Quran is stories, one third of Quran is theology, one third of Quran is no. law. And this is not far from the truth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses these stories in the Quran as the constant theme of the Quran. Why? Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses these stories? Because every single one of us, we love stories. From a child to adult, male or female, it doesn't matter which background you come from. If I'm telling the stories, mashallah, you will be listening to the stories. We all love to, it is ingrained in all of us. But there is a difference. Allah's stories are different than the stories of the men. Allah's stories are always truth. So every single time Allah tells you a story, it's a real story. It's not a legend. It's not a Bollywood or Hollywood movie film or a folklore. It's a real story. Allah's stories are Ahsan al Qasas, are the best stories. And I will tell you why they are the best stories, inshallah, in a bit. In a bit. Allah's stories are Ahsan al qasas they are the best stories, number two. Number three, Allah's stories, uh, what's the ayah? <laughs> Allah's stories are yatazakkara ulul albaab. Allah's stories are the stories in which there is wisdom, in which there is some kind of purpose. So every single story that is mentioned in the Quran is a story of a lesson, is a story of a moral, is a story of a wisdom. So there is a difference between Allah's stories and our stories. Mm -hmm. One very another interesting thing about the stories of the Quran is that when you listen to the stories of the Quran and you compare the stories of the Quran with other stories of other books that claim to be from God, there is a very huge difference. There is a very obvious difference that a lay person like me and you, even we can see. When you read the stories from other books that claim or says or pretends to be from God, you will see that there is so much detail. The stories are so dry. The son of so and so, and the son of so and so, and he came from this place, and he did this, and he was wearing these kinds of clothes. So much detail that we don't want to know. We don't want to know. In the story of the Quran, I am challenging you. How many stories of the Sahaba are mentioned in the Quran? Many stories? That refers to the stories of the Sahaba, indications to the stories of the Sahaba. How many Sahabas are mentioned in the Quran? One. One. Exactly. That's it. Usually in the stories of the Quran, there are no names. There are no places. There are no details. The crux of the story. Overall tale. The thing that you need to know to benefit from the story and that's it. No names. What they were wearing, what they were doing, where they came from. No details. No details. But if you look at the other scriptures and you read their story, you will read half... Go to the Bible. Go and read Bible. Half page of genealogy before every story. Half page of genealogy. This person was, a son and, uh, was the son of so-and-so, and that person was the, son and so, was the son of so-and-so. He came from this place, he did this, he was wearing this clothes, this and that and that. So much, more info so much information that you get lost. Mm. So much information that you don't even remember the story, the content of the story, you completely forget about it. Look at the Quran, hardly any names. Look at the Quran, hardly any places. 
Look at the Quran, hardly any information that you don't want to know. Hardly any of precise stories, small stories, the crux of the story, so that you can keep the track of the story and you can benefit from the story. Number one. Number two, another very amazing thing about the stories of the Quran is that there is so much information implied. When you read the stories, you pieces all of this information together. So for example, let me give you an example and you will understand. In this story of the people of the cave, I challenge you, give me one verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that there was a king and he was persecuting the Muslims. There is not even a single verse mentioned in the entire of Surah Al-Kahf where the king is mentioned and if this is mentioned or, or where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that there was a king and he was trying to kill Muslims. But we understand it. Mm -hmm. How do we understand it? That there is a people, there is a group of young people, they are trying to seek refuge in a cave and they believe in Allah and they don't want to worship false gods. So we understand it. Mm -hmm. What do we understand? That there is a king, obviously there is a king, he's pagan, he wants people to worship false god. that's why he's persecuting or he wants to persecute Muslims and that's why these Muslims are fleeing away. So we understand it. But the details are not mentioned in these stories. This detail it's not, so no need to mention all of these stories and this is the miracle of the Quranic story. This is the beauty of Quranic stories that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you so much information in so few verses. We are doing the tafsir of this one verse but Allah gave the information, all of this information in just this one verse. In three words it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala summarizes the entire story. So this is the beauty of the Quran. One final thing and then we are done inshallah. Just one final thing. Who are these people of Cape? Where are they from? Ulama have so many different opinions about that. So many different. Some scholars have said that this is a group in this place, this is a group from this place, this is a group from this place. So much so that without being, you know, without being facetious and without joking, there is hardly any culture, any Muslim culture in the world who swears by the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and says that in our culture there is the cave of the people, uh, there is the cave of, of uh, there is the cave of the sleepers. In our culture, there is the cave of the sleepers. Almost all cultures, all cultures, cultures in the Muslim world. So you have people from Tunisia, you have people from Malaysia, uh, sorry, you have people from Tunisia, you have people from Morocco, you have people from Algeria, you have people from Andalus, you have people from Sham, you have people from Jordan. And they all claim that they, their culture, there is the cave of the people of the cave, of the people of, uh, there is the cave of the sleepers. And I won't be surprised to meet a Pakistani guy or an Indian guy claiming yeah. the same thing, that in our culture there is a cave of sleepers. Mm -hmm. You know, you go to Gawandaran and you will find many caves. So there is this cave of sleepers, even in Pakistan and India. But Allah knows best. Allah knows best. Who are they, where they were, where they were from, we cannot know for sure. We cannot know for sure. No, let me, I just remember something, you know, very interesting. I remember many years ago, I think it was my second year in this mosque, and it was the month of Rabiul Awwal. And I was giving lectures, in the whole month of Rabiul Awwal, I was giving lectures on Juma about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I was actually trying to give a, a kind of biography of Rasulullah, a kind of seed of Rasulullah sallallahu And when I was talking about this first revelation that came to Prophet Muhammad, and I forgot the name of the cave. So I said, Ghari Sol. Instead of saying Ghari Hira, I said Ghari Sol. And I remember Fisa was sitting in the first cell. So in order to get the confirmation, I asked him and he just nodded his head. He was carried away with me because I was doing the speech and you know, all of a sudden I asked him, I, I, was it Qari Sol? And he just nodded his head. <laughs> there were other, other, other elder people, elderly people, Haji Sahban, they were also sitting in the first. Now the lecture was about Rasulullah, what kind of love we need to have for Rasulullah and how can we prove our love for Rasulullah. That was the whole lecture about. You know, Sheikh Saab, after the lecture is over, after the Jummah was over, People were coming up to me to correct this mistake of mine. That's not a problem. They can come to me and mistake, correct mistakes of mine. They can correct mistakes. But their whole emphasis was on this cave, the cave of Hira. Their whole emphasis was on this. And their whole emphasis was that why Hafiz Saab was not able to correct me at that time. Maybe he corrected me. He didn't correct me and someone tried to correct me. But because he said Ghar Esor, I said Ghar <coughs> So he said that I was trying to correct you, but because he nodded his head, that's why we never correct. So we forgot all about the lecture, what it was all about, and we just focus on this one name, Varisor or Vashihira. So where they were from, we don't we don't want to know these details. There is it doesn't matter where they were from. Some people said that they were early Christians. And it makes more sense that they were early Christians. But if they were early Christians, there is only one problem in that. 
If they were early Christian, then why the Yehud of Yisrael are asking about them? Why the Yehud of Yisrael are asking about them? There is this one person. Mm. So the only thing here is the only problem here that some people say, some scholars said that these Yehud of Yisrael, they were not actually the Yehud of Yisrael who were trying to persecute these Christians, these group of, they were not the Yehud of Yisrael. They were the Yehud of Iranian province. You understand what I'm saying? When people say that they were the early Christians, so the only problem is that if they were early Christians, then the Yehud of Yisrael should not be persecuting them. Because even the Yehud of Yisrael believe in Allah, the Christians believe in Allah, Yehud believe in Allah, right? So they should not be persecuting them. So the only thing that they say is that these were not the Yehud of Yisrael, they were the Yehud of Iranian province. And their king was Zoroastrian. He was fire worshipper. He used to worship fire. Mm. He was Zoroastrian, and that's why these people wanted to persecute these people. So these people might be they were Yehud, might be they were Christians, but whoever, whoever they were, they used to believe in Allah and their society was pagan. That's the only information that we need to know. Where they were from, which area they came from, we don't know it for sure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows no. best. And shall I the next question? What yeah. about time? Sorry? What about the time? I don't know. We don't know time. Yeah. There is a... I actually, before I began this tafsir series, there was this a huge... Uh, discussion on YouTube available with the with the slides and everything about the whole historical analysis of the people of the cave and that's what I wanted to do but then some people suggest me not to do it because there's so much difference of opinion in that and there's nothing that you can say for sure instead of focusing on where they were from and geograph ge geographically where they from, were from and what was the time zone and when did it happen he said you should focus actually one of my teachers he said to me that you should focus on the lessons that we learned from history because these are the lessons that are going to benefit us, inshallah. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pass on.